Hello everyone, uh, and thank you for coming today. Uh, I'm Ed Haythorn-Thwaite from Robot Bike Co. And uh, today I'm going to tell you about the story of uh, how we set about trying to make the world's best mountain bike, as the title says. And um, the story really starts back in the late 90s when uh, three of the four founders met at Bath University. And like so many students who are into mountain biking, we spent an awful lot of time riding bikes and, uh, and then talking about bikes. And, it, and we always said then we would love to make the ultimate bike together. Obviously then it was a dream um, and we all went down our own separate career paths. Uh, but now I'm here today. <laughs> and uh, I suppose the, the key question is what, what makes the ultimate bike? And there are, there are various things to that. And the most obvious ones, I suppose to a lot of people, are that it needs to be light and it needs to be strong. You want to be able to pedal it uphill, etc. It needs to be strong enough to take demands. And from that point of view, we've all got engineering backgrounds and we all wanted to make something that was soundly and honestly engineered and using right materials and right processes in the right places. Uh, and then the next key thing, certainly with uh, modern mountain bikes, is the suspension design. Uh, and I'll go on to that in a little bit more detail in a minute. And then the final thing, which, and this is really the, the key behind our brand really and what, and what we've done is that I think there was a huge gap in the market uh, that bikes didn't fit people properly. Uh, it's this really weird perverse situation where when I started out mountain biking back in the 90s, uh, most of the high-end bikes were made out of uh, metals that were welded, whether it be aluminium, steel, titanium, and they came in six, seven, eight sizes. And then as the change towards carbon fiber, certainly at the higher end, uh, the manufacturers, you know, using molds, expensive hard tooling. And the last thing they want to do is have to invest lots of money in sizes that maybe aren't sold in such high quantities. So even the very best frames, a lot of the top mountain bikes are only available in three sizes. Some are even less. And, you know, you just look at you guys in the audience, you come in so many different shapes and sizes. And so to us, to be able to offer uh, a bike that fits every customer perfectly was key. And so, yeah, we had all we'd all gone off into our own separate careers. I'd always been in the bicycle industry in one form or another, whether as a World Cup mechanic or a technical editor. So I've seen the bike industry from a lot of uh, different angles, ridden a lot of bikes. And that size thing had come to me and not just size, it's about how you want the bike to ride. You can change the geometry for different rides and people have different tastes. So, uh, and then Ben Arnold, one of the other founders, he uh, had a precision engineering background. And then Ben Farmer, uh, he's a composites man. Uh, he's, that's his main specialist field. He headed up the composites development at Airbus. He knows quite a lot about it. And then he uh, started to do more and more work with additive manufacturing. And it was then in 2012 that he came up with a concept uh, for what we're now doing. And that was based around this whole concept of using right materials, right places, and allowed us to, uh, to change the geometry of the bike and not be restricted to tooling. Uh, at this stage though, he knew that additive manufacturing was a, was a key part of our design. And to fit with our ethos of making the very best, we believe you need the best people you can find. Uh, and whilst Ben did have experience in additive manufacturing, he wanted, uh, when he was at Airbus, he had met a chap called Andy Hawkins, who is the final uh, member of the team, the founders. Uh, he had worked for the Renault Formula One team, leading their additive manufacturing side of things. And so we told our idea to him, and he immediately you know, loved the idea, and so thankfully he came on board. So that was in yeah, 2012, and since then, uh, we, we started refining the idea uh, and then it got to the stage where I go back to the suspension side of things and again we you know we did toy around for a little bit with developing our own design uh, but we quickly you know thought back to our you know values that you need the best people and that wasn't really our specialist fields none of us so we got in touch with a chap called Dave Weagle who's uh, arguably the world's most uh, a successful mountain bike suspension designer, worked for various companies. And again, we told him the idea. And uh, thankfully he loved it, so he joined on. So we had the suspension sorted and we had the general architecture of the bike sorted. And 
this is uh, the this is our first frame, the R160. It's a what class an enduro uh, mountain bike, 160 millimeters travel. And if you've seen many other high-end mountain bikes at the moment, you'll notice that this looks quite different. It's very much form follows function. Uh, we haven't got swoopy tubes. If you see carbon bikes that fail, it's almost always around complex areas, whether it's the bottom bracket or the headset. It's very difficult to align the fibers correctly. So in all those complex areas, we've uh, used the titanium add additive manufactured parts. They're far more suited to those complex shapes and complex loads. Uh, and yeah, so that's, that's the general principle. And obviously, because we're using AM to produce these lugs, we have them linked up to a parametric CAD model. And we can literally take measurements from a customer and we can input the model and then it spits out the, the models. So we can, you know, in, in future, we could almost have it linked to the website and straight to a machine. Uh, almost do it without any human interaction. And even at the moment, it's, it's very little. Once we've done the work to set up that parametric model, it's be very simple. Along the way, we, we obviously had this original concept of how, how we, we knew that additive manufacturing would allow us to do the, the custom side of things. But we, even we didn't really fully anticipate how many benefits there would be to the technology. And yes, there are well but um, what one of the uh, main advantages is the way that we we can join the tubes and this is something we came up with after the original concept uh, which is using a double lap shear joint uh, and the beauty of this is that joints tend to be uh, uh, weak in peel forces and this is those uh, gives an incredibly robust joint uh, we actually had uh, of these joints in various depths on all our bikes they're 25 milli millimeters deep. sorry is it not very hello all right uh so yeah all these joints are 25 millimeters deep uh and all, uh, the x2 university testing even at 10 millimeters they broke the test rig at 26 kilonewtons and i think we needed six kilonewtons for a safety factor of five so these, we've gone super robust. We've gone for lifetime guarantee rather than, you know, trying to beat the lowest weight. We're competitive weight wise, but we want it to be super strong. Uh, and the other benefit of this, and obviously you couldn't, you couldn't make a 25 mil deep joint with uh, one millimeter wall thicknesses using any other uh, technique as far as we're aware. They, you just wouldn't be able to build it. And yeah, the other, the other benefit is that for a bonded joint, you want to ensure that your adhesive is where you want it to be. And we can completely fill these joints uh, with the adhesive. And then as you insert the tube, the excess splurges out and you're guaranteed that everything it left in there is adhesive. If you have a single lap joint, when you push it on, you can sometimes scrape the adhesive off. So, you know, this is just one of the benefits of AM that uh, we sort of discovered as we were going down the path and things we could, things we could do. The other, one of the other key things we found was that, uh, and this is through our work with uh, Altair and their software, predominantly their topology optimization software, is that uh, though topology optimization and AM go together beautifully, the, the topology optimization has been around for you know, many years, but it spits out, you know, if you're trying to make the lightest, strongest part, it quite often spits out information, you know, results that you can't actually make using conventional manufacturing techniques. Um, but with AM, of course, there are some limitations, but far fewer. So this was uh, our original chainstay yoke, and it was one of the more complex parts. And as you can see, it was a, a three-piece part, two AM sections joined by a carbon tube. One thing was because of the orientation, uh, which you do have to worry about with AM, uh, we, we couldn't have a double lap joint on that cross brace, so we weren't entirely happy with it. Uh, so Altair said that they could do some work for us uh, to try and make this a one-piece part and use topology optimization to make it as light and uh, as stiff and as strong as possible. So we, we gave them the hard fixed points, for example, the, uh, where the bearings fit, where the tubes fit, uh, and then you know clearances for the chain and the tire, and then once we and we obviously give them the load cases, and then they press go or whatever the magic they do in at Altair, 
and they, it tells us where the material needs to be. Now, obviously, you wouldn't want to make a part that looks exactly like that because it's not the most beautiful, but you can then take these results, and like I said, it'd be very difficult to produce a part of that shape using conventional uh, techniques. So once we have that part, we then uh, turn it into something that's as close as can be whilst being visually appealing as well. And then we go back and cross-reference it with FEA to, uh, to check that it's uh, where it should be in terms of strength and stiffness, etc. Now, apart from those things, there's also been, uh, as time's gone on, we've learned other things about the, the advantages of additive manufacturing. And that's that one of the key things is, certainly as a startup, uh, relatively speaking, it was very uh, cheap, quick, and simple to develop a product. Uh, and we weren't, uh, you know, we could change various iterations really easily. We weren't stuck by expensive tooling. And, and also, from a, yeah, we weren't having to put in these big investments for in expensive tooling. And then linked to that is, is the fact that um, we can react really quickly to changes. And the, the bicycle industry is a very fickle industry in a way, literally. I mean, in the last couple of years, we've had three different wheel sizes. Uh, and you have new standards all the time that are nowhere near standards. And so uh, a lot of manufacturers, even the big ones, even the big manufacturers, when they develop a, a new carbon frame, they're, they're tied into that tooling for about two years. Some of the smaller ones are three years. So literally, if someone comes out in six months' time with a new thing that you want to include on your bike, you can't do that for another couple of years. Uh, we, can, we can react to all, that, uh, all those changes in technology. And with our parametric model, it's also quite easy to develop new, uh, new frames, whether it be for a different wheel size or a different travel. Uh, so yeah, it's incredibly flexible. The other, uh, the other key thing is that because we're not using molds, etc., we don't have to, and we're custom making. We're not having to, you know, have warehouses full of stock that we've had to uh, put up front. Uh, so yeah, like I said, certainly as a startup, those those kinds of things are really appealing. Obviously, compared to more conventional manufacture, you know, there are pluses and minuses to everything, and our recurring cost is obviously higher. Uh, than, than out of a, uh, if, if you'd bought a tool and then we're making lots of uh, just molded carbon fiber frames. But yeah, certainly for us starting up and I think going forward, it's just a very different business model. So I'm not sure whether established bicycle brands would ever go down the AM route. It'll be interesting to see, but yeah, you just need quite a different setup in terms of company, I think. Um, what other things? Uh, yeah, so it's really about all the details you can put in. We we have to have some uh, parts post machined uh, for the bearing fits, etc. And to be honest, I mean, people quite often ask us how how simple is it? They they think you get a CAD model and you put it into a, a machine and out comes your object. And I wish it was that simple, but it's not. There's a there's a lot of things with regard to orientation of your parts to minimise distortion uh, and things like that. But actually, the thing we've probably been the biggest challenge is making fixtures to hold these different shaped parts for the post machining. Uh, so yeah, nothing's, nothing's as simple as uh, some might think it is, but uh, it, ha it has been a very good process for us. Anyway, uh, I've probably said enough about it by now, so I'll just show you a little, uh, a little bit of uh, the bicycle in, in action on uh, our local trails outside uh, our office in Monmouthshire where we, uh, where we build the frames. So as you can see, they're, they're made for proper hard riding. And like I said before, we, we haven't designed them to be as light as possible. We, 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 we have quite strong uh, green, I suppose, values. And the last thing we want to be doing is making products that end up in landfill. 
Uh, so yeah, we've, we've built all these with the lugs so they don't even run into their fatigue zone. Uh, we had uh, the EN test uh, for bicycles, which we don't actually have to do because we're custom makers, but we did that. And most manufacturers send a, uh, a, a new frame for each of the six tests. Uh, we obviously couldn't afford to do that being a startup, so we sent one frame for all the tests, that's impact and fatigue. And the, uh, the frame that is uh, on the Renishaw stand now and uh, still being ridden about. Uh, so yeah, it's testament. They said, uh, I think they've only ever had one frame before that's gone through all tests uh, and come out the other side. Uh, so yeah, we, we've uh, definitely designed on the uh, conservative side, but that's the beauty again of AM, that we can, we can tweak that. If we have a lighter rider, uh, you know, we could potentially slim down the wall thicknesses, and it again goes back to that topology optimization software and the parametric model. All these kinds of things can be uh, tweaked. So the flexibility uh, of the process is, uh, is incredibly good. Uh, and then finally, I'd just like to uh, say thanks to a couple of companies. There's uh, Renishaw, who I'm sure loads of you know, make the uh, machines that we use to produce the lugs. Uh, and then Heiter Technologies, based in Bristol, they've been incredibly good uh, with helping to uh, turn our ideas into reality. And then, like I've said, the, uh, the guys at Altair with their topology optimization software uh, is in just incredibly well suited to uh, this manufacturing technique. And finally, I'd like to say thank you to all of you guys for listening to me.